This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 272 was recorded on May 20, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Freelancer.com, the Internet's premier website for putting independent freelance contractors in touch with employers who need their services. Our search for credible deflationists continues with David Rosenberg returning as this week's feature interview guest. Rosie will explain why he still sees deflation as the governing force and why he disagrees with the suddenly all-popular inflation narrative. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Talking Charts on Commodities and Crypto. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, uh, let's get to this S&P 500. I mean, more or less, we've been chopping around going into this option expiration, more or less uh, holding pretty close to near the highs with the S&P 500, close to 4,200. It's at 4,157 right now. What's your take on the market here? You know, I don't have much conviction at all about where stocks are headed from here. Uh, I will say we seem to be testing that 50-day moving average or or the time between tests of the 50-day moving average is getting shorter. And we certainly did see, uh, instead of getting another rally off that last test, you know, we have have two tests of the 50-day now with no rally to new all-time highs in between. And that might be a a change. So I am seeing more and more signs that this market is getting toppy, tired, heavy and so forth. But frankly, you know, as much as I want to make the argument that everything's overvalued and we need a cyclical bear market here, uh, I've been thinking that for years and it's not happening. And I think the reason it's not happening is we also have that crack up boom force in the economy. And I don't think making any big short bets on uh, indices is a good move here. All right, well, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index because uh, the U.S. dollar continues to be very weak, gravitating to those 2021 lows that were put in at the start of the year. Do you think uh, the dollar is going to find support here? Well, certainly things are getting real now, Patrick. We're back into the danger zone, if you will. There have only been five daily closes below 90 on the June dollar index contract. So, you know, out of uh, the entire year of 2021, only five daily closes. One of them was this week, and we're going to have a second one today unless there's a miracle. So, you know, we're we're getting to uh, pretty close to that 89 critical support level. We still need to get below it. Daily close below 89 would certainly change the game and say that there's maybe a lot more downside still to come. That won't surprise me, but, you know, the signal's not there yet. We're still waiting for it. All right, now we got to talk crude oil because crude uh, temporarily at the start of the week uh, was toying on an intraday basis with a, a fresh year high, and then suddenly things reversed very quickly in the last couple of days. Uh, what's going on? Well, that sudden reversal in the last couple of days is entirely about several different uh, leaked comments from various different officials alluding to the idea that the U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil exports are about to be lifted or under discussion to be lifted. In other words, essentially what they're saying is that President Biden is about to undo what President Trump did with Iran. Iran will be back in the business of selling oil. And on the one hand, you know, that is a really big deal. Iran's oil production is very significant. And if it were true that that oil were all off the market and all suddenly coming back onto the market, it would be a very significant uh, supply and demand imbalance story. Frankly, I don't think it works that way, Patrick. I think that all of that Iranian oil has been being sold all along on the black market. A lot of it's probably going to China. Now China is going to have to pay market prices for their Iranian oil rather than uh, getting it, you know, on the, on the QT, so to speak, from Iran or through who knows what intermediaries, they're going to have to come out of the shadows and do it in the lit markets, and it's going to cost them a little more. But in terms of supply-demand balance, I don't see it suddenly changing anything. It's not like a couple of years ago where Iran had you know tens of millions of barrels of oil literally just in tankers and floating storage sitting there waiting to send someplace. Uh, that's not the case right now. So I don't think this 
signal is as big of a deal as everybody else seems to think it is. But that is the factor, Patrick, which has been jerking the market lower this week. Eric, what did the inventory numbers come in at? Patrick, we had a build this week of 1.3 million barrels of crude oil. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 142,000 barrels. Gasoline and distillates were the big drawdowns. 2 million barrels in gasoline and 2.3 million barrels on distillates. So those finished product drawdowns exceeded the size of the crude build. So on the net, it was still a drawdown in petroleum products this week. U.S. production holding unchanged at 11 million barrels. All right, Eric, I want to talk about gold because uh, it's just been uh, great price action. It seems uh, every little sell-off is being immediately bought. Gold keeps working its way higher. We're at 1881 at the time of the recording. What's uh, your take here on gold? Well, I really want to hand it to you, Patrick, for that chart deck we had several weeks ago, which you titled, hey, it's time for gold. And I remember you told me off the air, like you thought this is the moment. You nailed that call because this chart just looks so bullish. We went right through the uh, 100-day moving average down at 1,800, climbed up over a fairly short period, right through the 200-day moving average without really pausing even. So far, we've had a total of four daily closes over the 200 day moving average, which is just around 1863. And although there was a brief intraday dip back below it, it's pretty much held above it. As soon as it broke above, it stayed above and it stayed there for several days. These are all really bullish signs. I did get a couple of listener questions this week, Patrick, people saying, hey, you told us last week you're not buying any more mining stocks because you've already got enough. How about telling us the ticker symbol so we can buy the same stuff that you've got? The reason that I don't tell the ticker symbols of what I buy in terms of mining stocks, Patrick, is primarily because I get those recommendations mostly out of Marin Katusa's newsletter. It's a paid subscription newsletter. And out of respect for his paying subscribers, you know, I don't want to tell people what his calls are. But the structure of those deals, also the reason that I choose those stocks is because Marin negotiates great deals for accredited investors. If you're not an accredited investor and you don't have access to those deals, I'm not sure that the stocks that I've chosen because of the special deals I was able to get through Marin are really you know, even the best stocks for people who aren't buying them that way. So that's the reason that I don't give any ticker symbols. All right, Eric, let's get to that 10-year Treasury yield, because uh, I really thought that uh, that high inflation print, uh, if there was ever a catalyst that could drive yields uh, to a a fresh year high, that would have been it. And instead, more or less, uh, we've been muddled. I mean, we're at 1.63 on the uh, the 10-year yield, and doesn't seem like uh, bonds want to go anywhere. What's your take on uh, the price action over the last week? Well, Patrick, I'm going to qualify this to say I don't have really strong conviction. You know, don't blame me if I get it completely wrong. But the way I feel about this is I think people were really starting to freak out and think, oh, my gosh, you know, the the big secular trend in secular bond bear market has begun. The sky is falling. the, The world is ending. Look, at the end of World War II, when rates bottomed and turned up again, there was a decade between bottomed and turned up again before they meaningfully started to to turn up. I think it's going to be a long, long time before we have 5% plus treasury yields. And uh, I think that people were starting to freak out about that. Seems like everybody's calmed down and the scare is over, but I wouldn't be surprised if we just test that 1.7 level again on the 10-year if there's another scare, another wave of it. And so let's see what happens. Fear and greed, Patrick. This week's feature interview guest is David Rosenberg. Now, Eric, why did we get uh, David back on the show this week? Patrick, as our regular listeners know, we have been on a quest to find credible, intelligent, smart people who are still deflationists to share that view because so many people have turned inflationists. David Rosenberg is one of the best respected economists in the entire industry, and he's probably one of the last deflationists standing. I think Dr. Lacey Hunt, who's just as prominent and just as well-known and just as well-respected, also a deflationist. We'd like to get Dr. Hunt back on the program, but uh, until then, I think David Rosenberg's about as uh, prominent as they come, and he is very much still in the deflation camp. So let's find out why. Eric's interview with David Rosenberg is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. 
In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. The third and final episode in Todd Buckholt's three-part series, Crossing the Bridge to Renewable Energy, is available now and features an in-depth interview with with Josh Crum, founder and CEO of Abex Technologies. Michelle Dennity will be back in the host chair on Saturday morning to chat with Gajan Tandia, CEO of Hitachi Vantara. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app to listen to this free podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is David Rosenberg, founder of Rosenberg Research. David, I've really been looking forward to this interview with you, specifically because all of our best macro experts that used to be devout deflationists have turned inflationist to the point that we literally have to go looking to find a deflationist left. Tell us your view. Is Has the world changed? Is it all inflation from here? Well, uh, I mean, that certainly has become um, the narrative in the markets uh, and in the media. I personally find it difficult to believe uh, that uh, the first global pandemic in over a century managed to unleash the inflationary forces uh, that uh, we couldn't generate over the course of the past four decades, that somehow it's the pandemic and the policy response of the pandemic, which has been to basically try and fill a leaky boat and preserve social stability, that we somehow now have in our hands a sustained uh, inflationary experience to deal with. I think that we've just swung the pendulum the other direction. Uh, this time last year, we had three months in a row of negative CPI readings. We had three months in a row of uh, declines in producer prices. Commodity prices across the board were plunging more than 20%. And if you remember, there was a day where the uh, front month contract on WTI actually went negative. So did we get uh, an outright pernicious, sustainable deflationary experience? The answer is no. What we had was we had a global shock, the pandemic, and the shock created the conditions where initially uh, the plunge in demand more than offset the reduction in supply. And that created the conditions for several months uh, of negative pricing. We fast forward to the current environment, and um, we have the situation now where, you know, courtesy of the economy reopening, uh, the vaccinations, all the fiscal juice that's in the system, demand has come back vigorously. And at the same time, uh, the supply side uh, has lagged behind. So we have this disconnect right now in the opposite direction between supply chains and demand. And it is creating, I mean, nobody in their right mind could tell you that we don't have inflation right now. Inflation in the sense that we do have a temporary period where pricing is uh, accelerating in, in several of the COVID-related sectors and in parts of uh, durable consumer goods um, where there are shortages. To me, it is uh, borderline disingenuous to say, well, the vaccinations and the reopenings are going to create the conditions for a surge in demand, but somehow the supply side won't come back. The supply side will come back. All you have to do is take a look at uh, the dramatic increase we're seeing in shipments and exports uh, out of Korea and Taiwan, and all they really do is make semiconductors. So with the lag, that's going to help ease the pressures everybody's talking about in the chip industry. And uh, you just have to take a look at the um, container ships that are filled to the brim outside the ports of LA and Long Beach, which are the two busiest ports in the United States, they haven't been unloaded yet, and partly because of the lingering impacts of the COVID. But to suggest that the supply will not come back, to me, is ridiculous. To start talking about labor shortages, indeed, because you do have some people that, are, that do fear going back to work, because the pandemic is not over, not even in the United States. And I say that, you know, with... Uh, over 40% of the population having been fully vaccinated, you know, you know, we will get there in probably four months if you're talking about herd immunity. But the lingering impacts of the pandemic, uh, the variants, are keeping people at the margin uh, reticent to going back to work. 
And of course, we have these extended, extremely generous jobless benefits that are paying people more to stay at home than to go back to their old job. This will all fall out of the data come September, October, where I expect the supply side is going to play catch up to the demand side. And we have to keep in mind, what is the story on the demand side outside of the vaccines is fiscal stimulus. But all the fiscal stimulus is just all very temporary, as we saw with the uh, April retail sales data. Uh, Everybody blew their brains out on the spending in March. So we have a stop and go economy on our hands. Uh, The fiscal policy and the short term nature of the stimulus has just accentuated the volatility in the data. So I actually believe that come the fall, we will start to see the reopenings having a positive impact on aggregate supply at a time when we're going to see fiscal withdrawal having a downward impact on demand. And so a lot of the inflation we're seeing today uh, is going to reverse, reverse course, I expect, either by late summer or early fall. Now, one of the arguments that a lot of people are positing here is that we've got a situation where there's been a political shift, where the last 10 years of QE has resulted in inflation, in a sense, in asset price inflation. The reason that these people uh, have suggested that it didn't go into consumer price inflation is because the money didn't go into the real economy. Now we've got a shift where the government aid money is being much more directed toward Main Street than Wall Street. Doesn't that change the calculus? You know, I I keep hearing about that we're into a a new era and that I keep hearing these words of regime change. But I heard the same things when Barack Obama got elected in 2008. Regime change, uh, a socialist out of Illinois, going to shift everything to the left. And of course, we got Obamacare. And then we had um, the bailout of the banking sector. That really put the lows in for the stock market back in March of 2009. And then we had Ben Bernanke, who was and is a Republican with repeated QEs, uh, zero interest rates. Uh, I mean, keep in mind that by the time the last expansion was six years old, the Fed was keeping the funds rate at zero and relentlessly expanding its balance sheet. So you could have argued back then that we had big regime change on our hands. But, you know, where was the inflation when all was said and done? And then we have Donald Trump being elected in November 2016. And tell me that we didn't have regime change on our hands. Uh, Do you remember how many times we were told to read that uh, book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, and uh, Stephen Bannon? And we had a new era, unless I'm mistaken. Didn't we not have a new era with Donald Trump, protectionism, isolationism, nationalism, In Donald Trump's inaugural speech in January of 2017, he used the word protection nine times. And he surely went ahead with uh, trade barriers and tariffs and restricted immigration. And so uh, where was the inflation? Where was the inflation? You know, I remember everybody talking about inflation after Donald Trump got elected. And we're going to have fiscal reflation because, of course, he cut taxes and uh, ultimately took the deficit up to a trillion dollars by the end of the last cycle. And a trillion dollars, I guess, at that point, we we view it as a pretty big number. So, you know, I I hear regime change all the time. Whenever we get a political shift, we get regime change. If I'm not mistaken, we were supposed to have regime change all the way back with Bill Clinton back in 1992. What happened to that regime change? So, you know, look, I made my living in a career out of fading, uh, you know, just the uh, the phraseology that comes out. Where, 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 where is this regime change? Uh, you know, we were talking about that we didn't have trickle down, all the gains in the stock market, the real estate market. But someone's got to explain to me how it is that, you know, Donald Trump didn't get reelected more because of character and personality issues than it had to do with how he handled the economy. Because his, his approval rating on the economy right till the bitter end was his strongest point. So where does this come out that about the, um, you know, the haves and the have nots and uh, there was no trickle down, you know, when month in, month out towards the end of his presidency, all Donald Trump talked about was how the unemployment rate for African-Americans and for Hispanics and for Asian, like for all minority groups, youth, women, they all went to historic lows, all time lows. And the reality is that the data are where the data are, those were areas where he was actually correct. We went into this pandemic, if you don't mind me saying so, 
And I throw the question back with unemployment rates among minority groups and the youth and women, the lowest levels on record. So explain to me again what was broken. We had a 10-year economic cycle, and uh, we had the lowest unemployment rate at 3.5% in 50 years. And uh, at the peak, inflation was barely more than 2%. So what am I missing exactly in terms of this so-called uh, regime change that we're seeing right now? How, how is that going to cause inflation? So you get these people out there. And uh, these are smart people. Uh, they're economists. These are people I know, many I'm, I'm friends with, who will tell you, well, look at the money supply numbers. But I come back and say, but for the past 20 years, the money supply numbers have had no correlation with anything except maybe asset prices. And you're quite right. We've had dramatic asset inflation. Well, look, there's, there's different ways, even regulatory, uh, that we can deal with that if that's a big problem. But you cannot predict inflation with just the money supply, because you have to take a look at money velocity. And money velocity has been contracting for decades because we're choking on too much debt, and it has impaired the credit multiplier. So I don't see that that's changed. Money supply against money velocity is not leading right now to an inflationary conclusion. Oh, people are now saying, well, look at wages. Look at all these companies announcing wage increases. And of course, to lure these people that work in the consumer cyclical industries, whether it's restaurants or in the hotel business or theme parks. You know, once again, a little history goes a long way. I remember back after Trump cut taxes on the corporate side and allowed companies to repatriate tax-free their earnings from abroad back home and every, all these companies. I listed 20 of them in my morning note the other day. Uh, 4% of the corporate sector announced wage and bonus increases back in in early 2018, some bellwether companies too. So where was the big inflation coming out of that? And now all of a sudden, you can't read a headline without some company wait, raising wages. But where is that really inflationary? How do you just basically say wages go up, inflation goes up, when you know as an economist that it's unit labor costs, it's productivity adjusted wages that will drive inflation. That was the 1970s. The 1970s wasn't that wages went up 10% a year. It's that wages went up 10% a year in a decade where productivity was stagnant. So here we have a situation which nobody talks about what's really important, which is that we just got last week a first quarter productivity number that's showing that that productivity is running over a 4% annual rate. Now, whether that's a secular or structural change, I'm not sure. But, you know, everybody talks about regime change in an inflationary way, but nobody talks about the fact that in the weakest year for the U.S. economy since 1946, it was the best year for productivity in a decade. Companies actually realized for all the lamenting of shortages and job shortages and job shortages and job shortages, the reality is that the corporate sector actually had its best productivity performance in a decade, in the same year that we had the worst year for employment since the 1930s. But we had the numbers for the first quarter and passed the eye of the storm for the pandemic. And productivity, even with employment coming back, we had a situation with over 60% of the jobs that were lost have come back. And yet, even with that, productivity is running over 4%. Now, it's hard to really judge whether that's noise or whether that's a fundamental shift. But let me just tell you that if you have productivity running over 4%, and let's say that that's what the data are showing right now, you could have wages running at 5%, and they're not even running at 5% yet, and you still wouldn't get the inflation. Because what drives the inflation is productivity-adjusted wages, not nominal wages on their own. And I can't believe how many people can't wrap that simple economic theory around their head. And so they come out and say, well, you know, ah, look at the fiscal stimulus, all the fiscal stimulus. Yes, indeed, we have rampant deficits. But you can't take a look at the overall inflation and interest rates without looking at national savings. This is the problem people had in Japan, who basically paved more riverbeds and built more bridges to nowhere in the name of fiscal stimulus than Japan, where they've had blowout fiscal deficits for 20 years. And yet look what interest rates and inflation have done there. Because nobody pays attention to what's happened with private sector savings, which has been an offset to the de-savings in the public sector. So everybody's taking this very uh, myopic and narrow view on what drives inflation and what drives interest rates. So you can't look at fiscal policy without looking at the context of what's happening in the household sector and in the business sector. 
You look at the business sector, there's been a negative financing gap of over $100 billion in the past year. Companies, and there was an article on this on the front page of the Wall Street Journal the other day, and now companies are, are retaining cash on their balance sheet. Okay, so in taking a look at retained earnings, you're taking a look at corporate cash flows, and taking a look at capital spending intentions, there's no signs here that the corporate sector is doing anything but raising its de facto savings rate. And what about the household sector? Everybody's talking about, well, look at this 30% personal savings rate that's out there. That's dry powder for future spending. Well, I don't know. That didn't work so well with April retail sales, did it? It didn't. And so we don't know where the personal savings rate is going to end up. What we do know, and the New York Fed has done the work for us, is the New York Fed has shown that only one quarter of this these stimulus checks, and there's been three rounds so far dating back to last year, have gone into the real economy. The other three quarters are split pretty evenly between savings, and a lot of that savings is indeed going into the market, which is why you've had this, this uh, explosion of uh, Reddit accounts and Robinhood accounts. But a third of the money is going to pay down debt. I'm looking at the bank lending numbers. And look at the bank lending reports. The, the banks beat their earnings. Yes, capital, markets activity, wealth management, trading. Look at the loan books of the major banks in the United States. They're shrinking. There's credit contraction in the private sector. You're seeing it in the bank lending data. So, so you, I'm, what I'm saying is that you have to take a real holistic view. Inflation, as is the case with most broad economic variables, it's very complex. But I'm just finding people are either doing partial equilibrium analysis or they're just taking a very narrow view to what ultimately is going to drive inflation down the road. We have tremendous distortions and disturbances in the data. I mean, take a look at what happened in the April CPI numbers. I mean, come on. The CPI sports ticket price subindex went up a historic 10% in one month. In one month. But meanwhile, if you took a look from July to December of last year, the BLS wasn't even reporting what prices were doing at sports events from last July to December. The next thing you know, stadiums, arenas, baseball parks, they're filled with five or 10,000 fans or they're selling out in Texas because you're talking about people that will pay anything now to watch any game. Oh, and there's big inflation. This is not anything that's sustainable. You had... Uh, what, you had a 10% surge in, in airfares. Yes, they've cut capacity. People are dying to fly. Are you going to tell me like in six months, the airlines are going to be raising prices 10% again? This is, a, this is the one area I do agree with Jay Powell. There is tremendous noise and disturbance and dislocation in all the data right now, because guess what? We are still living with a global pandemic. And there's all sorts of offsets between the reopenings and the vaccines and with fiscal policy, which is very short-term in nature. And I'll just hazard to say that this time last year, we're talking about deflation. Now, this time this year, we're talking about inflation. And I will tell you, with a virtual guarantee, we'll be talking about something else in four or five or six months' time. And I'm saying it will not be about today's inflation experience. But with respect to today's inflation experience, it sounds like what you're saying is the Fed actually has it exactly right in describing this as a transitory phenomenon. We've got some inflation right now because the economy is having trouble getting started up and, and responding quickly to demand. It'll all come back out and we'll be back to what we've been used to for the last several years. That's the way you see this playing out. If that's right, it means a whole bunch of people are really, really wrong. And that means market opportunity, because a whole bunch of things have moved quite a long ways in a inflation is coming, and not just inflation, but secular inflation is coming. If people are wrong about thinking that, and we don't really have secular inflation coming, what's the best trade to kind of play that crowds got it wrong? Well, look, let me just say that... Um... I'm not going to actually say that the markets have anything particularly wrong. What I'm saying is that the narrative that you're reading and hearing about day in, day out, that narrative is wrong. You know, look, the Wall Street Journal runs with an, an editorial that, that uses as its inflationary thesis the one year, the one year inflation expectation component out of the University of Michigan index, which just came out on Friday for May. What they don't tell you is that if you back out the two to five year inflation expectation, because the one year is just if you plot the one year 
inflation expectation against gasoline prices. That's your story. But the two to five year, the two to five year hasn't moved. It's still in the range. Uh, for that particular metric, it's 2.7%. It's still in the range. The two to five year, if, if you go into taking a look at the tips market or the break even inflation levels out of the out of the uh, bond market, you'll see that most of the inflation expectation is still very near term, like really out to the next two years. If you're taking a look at the at the at the break even spreads between twos and fives and fives and tens and twos and thirties, you'll see that there's been no big outbreak of longer term inflation expectations. That's actually very encouraging. It's just telling you that right now we have a tremendous dislocation. And yes, it's going to probably going to last a few more months. It's not just year over year base effects. There is some real price increases coming into the fore. But you know what? What would you expect? I, I mean, look, we just had a 10% increase in airfares in the CPI index. They're still down 20% from where they were pre-COVID. You know, the the, the sports tickets and the like uh, that were up 10% in April. You know, they're they're down significantly from where they were pre-COVID. And so there's still tremendous amount of distortions. And yes, you're going to find that some companies will continue to raise prices while they can to preserve their margins. But remember, inflation is a, a long-term process. There's nothing in there, and there's nothing actually in the markets telling you that it's going to be long-term in nature. We have a short-term dislocation on our hands. And, and I do believe that it's going to be resolved for the reasons that I've discussed which is that demand will slow in the second half of the year, I think materially, once the fiscal stimulus runs out. And I think that April's retail sales, which nobody talks about because everybody's so consumed about inflation, nobody's talking about the fact that core control retail sales were down 1.5% in the month of April. That's a pretty big deal. And it's telling you that people already spent what they want to spend out of that fiscal stimulus. There's no pent-up demand in merchandise goods. That much is for sure. and we're not getting another round of stimulus checks. And then we're going to have the jobless benefits that are going to term out. That has to be your expectation. And so we're going to have different contours. We will not continue to hear stories of there being um, labor shortages beyond uh, the end of the third quarter. That's my expectation. You know, if I'm right on this, I guess that you'd say that um, whatever inflation expectation that is in the market will come out. I think that that would mean that the treasury market undergoes a uh, a bull flattener. And I'll just say this much, you know, uh, it's interesting that, you know, that when I'm taking a look at the Cleveland Fed's uh, five-year inflation expectation measure, so the Cleveland Fed actually has a model. What's the model for tips break-evens? It's not a model, it's just a residual, and it's correlated to the CRB index. And that's all people in the markets look at for their inflation view as they look at the CRB index. And so you've got these measures, say, uh, in the uh, tips area that are at least uh, call it roughly two and a half percent for inflation expectations in the bond market. The Cleveland Fed's five year inflation expectation measure is actually one point four eight. It was one point three seven in March. So it's not as if it stayed static. But you see that the Cleveland Fed actually has a model. And I've actually found that their numbers actually do have at least some correlation with the labor market. There is no correlation with the labor market in the tips break evens. It's all the CRB index. So when you're asking me how to be positioned, look, if if the break even inflation expectation metrics in the treasury market converge on the Cleveland Fed's inflation expectation measure, you know, you'd be talking about um at least a 25% total return in the long bond in the next 12 months. If the convergence happens that the market ends up gravitating towards where the Cleveland Fed is, keeping in mind that the Cleveland Fed's model is a real model, okay? I'd say that if I'm right on this call, you know, because a lot of it is premised on the economy slowing down. You, you know, nobody talks about the fact that the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index today, just hit the lowest level in 11 months. Okay. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I don't think anybody knows that. Nobody knows that. Well, because why? Because everybody has inflation on the brain. But inflation is really all about a supply and demand curve, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. And we have supply constraints right now. Inflation 
is going to rise near term. It already has. And I think the operative, anybody rolls their eyes when you use the word transitory today, people just laugh at you. But, you know, what else could it be? Demand is going, we, we, we borrowed so much growth from the future with these rolling temporary fiscal stimulus packages. We just borrowed all this growth from the future. Look, we just hit, we just hit a million units on new home sales in the month of March. Well, I got news for you. We built, we, you know, they're up 60% year on year. Now you'll say, well, that's coming off a really depressed numbers in 2020. That much is true. But even if you correct it for that. So, you know, people talk about, well, you know, housing, uh, there's shortages here. Uh, shortages, they talk about shortages of labor in housing. Meanwhile, residential construction employment in March and April together were up over 30,000. It's just, uh, just finding people are just making things up. The reality is that we have no pent up demand. Uh, autos, 18 and a half million units. When you had 18 and, a half, 18 and a half million units in any cycle in the past, that is peak autos. They are down substantially in the next six, six to 12 months. Home sales, like I said, over a million units. Last time we were there was in the summer of 2006. Home sales were down 30% in the next 12 months. Housing starts were down 20%. So it's very interesting to me that um, we don't have pent-up demand for the things that normally carry the expansion through the through the recovery phase. This is how unusual. We're relying on demand in um, to come back with the reopening in airlines and restaurants and theme parks and movie houses and basically we're talking about four percent of gdp is where this v-shaped recovery is going to come but at the same time because we have no pent-up demand in durable goods which is a two trillion dollar business that i think is what people are going to be surprised at how weak demand is going to be once we see the emperor disrobed when i say the emperor disrobed i mean that this economy has been medicated so many times in fiscal stimulus what happens when you take the candy away? And Joe Manchin has already said, and there's no more important person in Washington than Joe Manchin has already said, he's not signing on. He is not signing on to more stimulus checks, especially to people that don't need them, which is how this fiscal policy has been constructed. You're talking to me about haves and have-nots and about inequalities. And here you have the Biden. This is the irony. This is the irony is, is Joe Biden has only exacerbated those inequalities by giving fiscal stimulus, by stimulus checks to people that don't need it. Like the New York Fed has already come out and said only a quarter of this money is actually going into the real economy. Three quarters is not. And about half of that three quarters is going into the market. And here we're talking about that we have the new, a new regime of leveling the playing field, really, by giving money to people to open up Robinhood accounts. That's And to drive equity prices even higher. <laughs> You know, that's um, my head is spinning over that concept. But the point I'm making is that is that what people can't see around the bend is that demand is going to be weakening, I think, significantly after the second, maybe third quarter and supply is going to come back and people will be surprised how low inflation is. So I said both flattener and treasuries. And I would say that uh, growth will reclaim its leadership over value since value is so deeply cyclical value really needs higher interest rates higher inflation which it's been getting for the past call it six months but they call it a value trade for a reason because it's a trade and there's a reason why growth stocks outperformed value 80 percent of the time in the last expansion and it's because the structural factors at work that have kept inflation at bay haven't gone away because of the pandemic or the policy response of the pandemic. And we're talking about Asian demographics, which is disinflationary, not inflationary. When you take a look at the whole demand supply effects of aging demographics and you look country by country, we did the cross-sectional analysis on this. You know, somebody wrote a book and, and, and a client of mine sent it to me about how demographics are, are inflationary. It's like everybody's got inflation on the brain. Uh, no, aging demographics are not inflationary. And aging demographics disruptive technology, and that's ongoing. And that we did not have in the 1970s. And we're choking on too much debt. That's why money velocity is going down. That's why people are choosing to save most of the stimulus. And so when you have an all economy, when you look at households, businesses, and governments together, so because we all own this debt, we all own this debt. This debt is all ours. We can talk about the government sector all we want, but the government represents the people. 
Debt at all levels of society in the United States has never been as high as it is today, 366% of GDP. That does not include, by the way, the unfunded liabilities in the system. 366% of GDP. I cannot believe how people are not alarmed at that number. It's up 40 percentage points in the past year. Well, of course, we had to fight a pandemic. But you see, we've never had a year where that ratio went up 40 percentage points. But if you notice in the past 40 years, we peak at a new debt ratio, and yet inflation is peaking at lower and lower levels. Bond yields peaking at lower and lower levels because this is a tourniquet. This is the most pervasive constraint on aggregate demand in the future is the grotesque level of debt we have in our hands right now. Now, people will say, oh, but we can afford the debt because interest rates are low. Yes, of course. That's exactly the story. Interest rates can't rise with that level of debt without sending the economy back into a destabilizing recession. David, I'm still having a hard time understanding what seems to me like a dichotomy here, because on one hand, you're saying something which I agree with very much, which is the Biden administration should not be paying people to stay home and not work. And that is what they're doing. But wait a minute. That's the reason I think we do have a inflationary impulse here is specifically because the government is paying people to to not work. And, and you're, you're losing supply of labor to people who are collecting a stimulus check. How, how is it that I get a conclusion that's inflationary and you don't? I feel like I'm missing something. Well, because uh, it's more to do with our time frame. So if you're going to tell me that the Biden team has taken out blank number of people permanently out of the labor market, I'd say, uncle, I submit. But that's not the case, right? Like these extended benefits end in early September. So the answer to your question is yes, that's part of the temporary supply constraint. Uh, well, the Biden team turned this into a UBI, a universal basic income. Well, let's wait and see for that to happen. And uh, now we have at least 10 states run by Republicans that are terming out these extended um, and uh, overly generous benefits earlier than scheduled. Maybe they'll serve as some useful templates in terms of what's happening to their participation rates and unemployment rates and what's happening with uh, labor competition and wages in those states. So we'll have a few months of a template. But it's what I'm saying, I never said to you that we're not going through a, uh, a a short-term dislocation. And part of that is the policy response. But I said at the very beginning of the show that we had three months of outright pernicious deflation a year ago. Did it last? Why didn't it last? Was every was everything permanent? It wasn't permanent. You know, we found out that actually the COVID-19 was not the bubonic plague. It was not the bubonic plague. That this is not going to be a repeat of the Spanish flu that killed so many other people and young people in 1918, 1919. And then we had the vaccinations, which was a huge game changer, obviously. So if the deflation a year ago wasn't permanent, why do you think that the inflation we're seeing right now is going to be permanent? That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying, I mean, I do have two eyes. I do see what's happening in, in front of me. But I guess it comes down to your question before. I'm not the least bit embarrassed, and believe me, I have I have disagreed with Jay Powell in his tenure more than I've agreed with him. I probably agreed with him a lot more, you know, when he was governor than when he took. But then, when you take the the reins at the Fed, you become somewhat of a politician. Be that as it may, I think that the Fed has got the narrative right. I think that they've done a stellar job actually in their communication skills. I'd actually, if I was Jay Powell at the next press conference after the meeting, I would wheel out a blackboard and explain to people what inflation truly is. And inflation is not four months of accelerating prices or wages. That's not what it is. Would you say that Paul Volcker was a big inflationist? Would you say that he was? Uh, I would not say that. I don't think anybody would, right? But what if I told you that the price level in his seven years at the helm of the Fed, the price level, the CPI under the inflation dragon slayer, the CPI went up 60%. Has your mind changed about Paul Volcker? The price level went up 60% under his tenure. No, because the rate of inflation, the second derivative, because inflation is a process that went from 12% down to 4 The inflation rate went from 12 to 4 and he's viewed as 
the world's most significant inflation dragon slayer of all time. But the price level went up 60%. But how can you not call that inflation? But he's the inflation dragon slayer. Well, you asked before about an anomaly. Is that not an anomaly? It's not because the inflation rate went down. And uh, Ben Bernanke, who tried to create more inflation than Ben Bernanke? His helicopter, his, his nickname is Helicopter Ben. He was at the Fed, at the helm of the Fed for eight years. And did you know that in his tenure, uh, the price level went up like 15%. It went up a fraction of what it did under Volcker. Volcker tried to create disinflation and he got it, even though the price level rose. Who tried harder? I mean, you talk about regime change. I mean, I'm asking you once again, rhetorically, there was no regime change with Ben Bernanke. Who even knew what QE was before 2008? I was at Merrill Lynch back then. I had to do teaching lessons on QE. And they didn't just stop at one QE. And ZERP, zero rates. And, and so that wasn't regime. Quantitative easing wasn't regime change. And where was the inflation? Well, all the structural factors I was talking about, which have gone even more disinflationary, acted as a massive offset to anything we ever saw cyclical. I will come back again. You know, the, the optimist and the pessimist meet for a cup of coffee. And uh, the optimist says to the pessimist, you know, things can't possibly get any better. And the pessimist says, you know what? I think you're right. So I guess somebody's got to explain to me that if we, how it is, how it is that we got to a three and a half percent unemployment rate by early 2020 and late 2019, lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, coming off a 10 year expansion, a five fold increase in the equity market, a booming residential real estate market, and uh, inflation was barely above 2% with a 3.5% unemployment rate. The tightest labor market in 50 years. And the last time we had uh, an unemployment rate that low, the, the inflation rate was more than double where it was this time around. But yet somehow, because of the pandemic, we just miraculously created, we waved a magic wand that we got a new inflationary experience on our hands. So I'm just saying, how how is that possible? You're talking to me about temporary dislocations. I'm saying that in reality, we have a U6. The broadest unemployment rate measure is 10.4%. But like, I only know my history. And you know what? Maybe, maybe it's different this time. Maybe it's different this time. But I know from the past that full employment, a really fully employed economy, is when the U6 is at 8%. We're at 10.4. Oh, but we got some big, big wage inflation coming. Big inflation with a 10.4% U6. How does that make any sense to anybody? And then, of course, we have a cap U rate in industry, in manufacturing, that's 74%. 74. But I know historically that metric's got to get to 78 to get real inflation, not four months inflation, four years of inflation. Let's just talk about inflation is not a four-month phenomenon. You cannot judge if you're in a bull market or bear market just on four months, okay? So time is every bit as important. Duration is as important to making these calls as magnitude. So I'm trying to say here that, well, boy, when I take a look at the unemployment rate in the labor market and where it usually is when we have meaningful inflation, and I'm taking a look at the unemployment rate in the manufacturing sector, the cap U rate, and where it normally is when we actually get more than just a few months of inflation, but a few years, I get, I get that we still have an output gap in this country of over 2% of GDP. And we're already halfway through the biggest fiscal stimulus we've ever seen before with the stimulus checks that looks to have already been spent in the month of April. So what am I missing? What am I missing? How is it? I'm looking at the supply of labor. I'm not talking about what is temporarily held back for reasons due to COVID or the policy response to COVID. I'm looking and I'm seeing the total supply of available labor in the United States is 17 million. Before the pandemic, it was 10 million. We have a labor pool that is 7 million. The delta is 7 million over where it was before the pandemic. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we have this radical hitting the wall on labor supply. And I'm thinking, well, that might be the story right now for a variety of reasons that have temporarily held back this labor supply. But I don't spend my time talking about what's happening right now. 
I talk about what we'll be talking about six and 12 months down the road. That's how I spend my time because that's what's most important. Because if the markets are forward looking, why would they care about what's happening at this very moment in time? It got priced in already. So I'm saying, yeah, uh, what I see is that uh, we're going to see a supply response and we're going to see a demand slowing that is going to rectify a lot of these imbalances that we're seeing right now in the data, especially the inflation data. You mentioned a bull curve flattener as a potential trade here. I assume that means you don't think that 10-year Treasury yields are going to continue backing up the way some people, you know, some people are afraid we're, we're headed to 5% from here. Uh, where do you see Treasury yields headed? You know, look, I remember turning on CNBC after Trump got elected, and, and Larry Lindsay, who was governor of the Fed, was talking about 5% Treasury yields. I mean, we barely at one point in late 2018 got above 3%. Who wasn't talking about all of this? Who wasn't talking about when Trump got elected? That's all you heard was about inflation. You heard, so you heard, uh, restricting immigration, wage inflation, tariffs, trade barriers, nationalism, protectionism, all the stuff Steve Bannon it was all about. I mean, what am I missing? I mean, it's coming back and asking, weren't these same people talking about inflation after Trump got elected? Am I mistaken about that? So I think that it's very interesting is that, um, Treasury yields seem to have peaked. You couldn't have thrown much more in the way of data. Million jobs a couple of months ago. 0.9 on core CPI, another big number on PPI. And uh, the bond market right now is just in a range. And uh, I would say that there's certainly a high level, an elevated level of inflation uncertainty. And uh, I think that there will be a premium in the Treasury market until they get resolved. But you see, I'm saying the inflation uncertainty will get resolved in a certain direction that I do think that the consensus has gone the other way. But that doesn't – what the consensus is saying is uh, – look, I'm, I'm waiting. I'll tell you the truth. I read vociferously, voraciously. I read all the newspapers. I read all the periodicals. I, I read as much as I can my competitors' research. I'm dying. For somebody to put out something insightful that will get me to change my view. I haven't seen it yet. I just see a lot of partial analysis. I don't see any general equilibrium analysis. I don't see how nobody's even talking about how is it that we can get an inflation with a U6 of 10.4. Who's explained that? You know, and so everything, it's just all very short-termism. I, I admit it. I admit it. We have inflation now and for the next several months. Admittedly, admittedly, just like we had deflation a year ago for a few months. And I asked the question, if the deflation wasn't persistent, why would you think the inflation is going to be the persistent? What is it that's going to take inflation higher that wouldn't have done it last cycle? We finished the last cycle with negative real interest rates. If I'm not mistaken, Powell cut rates three times in 2019, re-expanded the balance sheet as the repo market blew up in his face. And um, we had ongoing trade frictions and tariff barriers and tariff increases and a 3.5% unemployment rate. Like, what do you do for an encore? And now people are talking about we're going into a new inflation cycle. But you see, they said that after Clinton got elected in 92. The big socialists from Arkansas going to rewrite the social contract. Really? You know what happened to Bill Clinton? What happened to Bill Clinton was called the 1994 midterms. Oh, and then we had regime change, inflation regime change with the other socialists from Illinois, Barack Obama. Didn't you know? Big inflation coming. And, and Bernanke is on his side, which he was. Well, so explain to me, where, where, where was the inflation from that regime change? What got in the way of a Barack Obama was once again was the midterms in 2010. Oh, let's see. Donald Trump. Donald Trump was supposed to be massively inflationary. And that was actually the mantra at the very beginning. And bond yields went up. Cut taxes at a time of full employment. Where, where, was, where was the inflation? Tariff increases. We're going to have tremendous cost pressures from tariffs. Okay. Did it last a month or two? Was it a pernicious month-over-month -month inflationary environment? We finish off the cycle with a 3.5% unemployment rate. And inflation is barely above 2%. <laughs> so um, it is all very interesting. And what gets in Donald Trump's way, of course, on regime change is the 2018 midterms. So people are just, you know, I don't know. Do they, do, they, do they look at history? Do they understand history? Do they not know that there is no regime change in a country that has a two-year political cycle? 
Do people not understand? And they don't because everybody lives in the here and now, and they can't see past the tip of their nose. There is no regime change in a two-year political cycle. So everybody's talking about, we're going to have modern monetary theory. We're going to have ongoing fiscal expansion, never ending. We're going to go to a universal basic income. Really? Well, I think people don't quite understand how lucky Biden was to have emerged with those victories, razor thin in the House and the Senate. And my assumption is that they're going to go, they're going to flip. They're, both houses are going to flip. But all you need is one in the 2022 midterms, which all of a sudden is just next year. So explain, explain to me where the regime change is in a two-year political cycle. Well, David, I can't thank you enough for another terrific interview. Before I let you go, though, I do want to change the subject to Rosenberg Research because you have become an iconic figure in the industry in the last several decades for writing Breakfast with Dave, your daily newsletter. But you've expanded your offerings now with Rosenberg Research. For people who don't know what's new at Rosenberg Research, please bring us up to date. Sure. Well, you know, I would invite everybody to go on the website, just um, Google Rosenberg Research, and it'll take you right there. And we have the capacity, actually. We, 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 we have group deals, and uh, we have um, discounted packages. But if you wanted to create your own a la carte, you just have to talk to one of my um, client representatives, and they'll help you construct something that is going to be um, uh, relevant for you. And um, it's true. We have, uh, you know, I, I used to be, when I was at my previous jobs, it was always just breakfast with Dave. But now we have a monthly strategizer. It's called the Strategizer, and it's a very active equity market, fixed income and currency market uh, idea generation on how to invest. You know, in my missives, I'm usually 20,000 feet up in the air. The Strategizer is for the active investor uh, who's more like, you know, maybe 20 or 100 feet up in the air. So we do that monthly. I, I do a variety of webcasts as well. Uh, I've had Howard Marks on the call. I've had uh, Jeffrey Gunlock on the call. I've had Leon Cooperman on the call and Neil Ferguson and the like. So I do those pretty well once a month. And there's a variety of other um, of uh, written material, special reports that we uh, try and cover everything. Quite often, it's our clients that give us ideas on what to write on. So also doing special reports that we'll do a couple a month on big picture uh, issues. We're just finishing, uh, just finished one on the outlook for emerging markets as an example. So we, we cover a lot of ground. I invite everybody to go on the website. Uh, just go to Rosenberg Research. You can always email me directly uh, at drosenberg at uh, rosenbergresearch.com. That's drosenberg at rosenbergresearch.com. And we offer free uh, one-month trials. So uh, we always want to have people come in and kick our tires. Uh, they can either buy our our basic or premium packages, uh, or quite often just say, no, I, I like this, that, and the other. Can you mock up what, what makes sense that could work? So we also have that custom. But we like everybody to come on, have a full month experience, and then make up their minds, uh, you know, what it is that they would, um, that they would like to, uh, to purchase. Uh, you know, the business has gone great. We were up to 3,000 relationships in 40 different countries. So it truly is global in nature, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, folks, Rosenberg Research may or may not be for you long term, but you can't go wrong with the free trial. So I strongly recommend that. And certainly Breakfast with Dave is one of the best known and best respected letters in the entire industry. Listeners, we have a treat for you in your Research Roundup email. There's a link to a chart deck from David. Now, I didn't tell you about it at the beginning of the interview because we didn't go through the chart deck in the interview. Why didn't we go through the chart deck? It's 142 pages of really fantastic macro graphs and charts high quality stuff that you usually have to pay for it's good stuff free if you get it from macro voices so be sure to download that chart deck we didn't discuss it in this interview but it's really worth your while the download link is in your research roundup email david we look forward to getting you back on the show in a few months for an update patrick serezna and i will be back right after this message from our sponsor Freelancer.com is the world's largest crowdsourcing marketplace with over 50 million freelancers and 20 million projects posted in 34 languages and 39 currencies. 
The future of work is now online. And at Freelancer.com, you can get any job you can possibly think of done over the Internet by a global workforce of skilled freelancers. Whether it be web design, graphic design, software development, writing the copy for this ad, backtesting trading algorithms, or building financial models, no matter what the gravity or complexity of the work, definitely give Freelancer a try. Freelancer.com is used by consumers all the way up to large organizations such as NASA, Airbus, Deloitte, Unilever, Facebook, and IBM. To gain investment exposure to the world of work online, Freelancer.com just listed over-the-counter under the ticker symbol FLNCF and is listed on the Australian Securities Exchange under ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have David back on the show. And he certainly put a lot of thoughts in my mind in terms of really whether this is going to be transitory or whether this is a, a, that secular inflation that we were looking at. What did you take away from the interview? Well, I really enjoyed this interview, Patrick. And the reason is, frankly, I have a lot of respect for David Rosenberg. So I do disagree with him. The idea that I don't agree with someone as prominent and intelligent as David Rosenberg really makes me take pause and say, hmm, maybe I ought to reconsider. What am I missing here? After listening carefully to David, I understand, I think, exactly where he's coming from. I understand why he's still in the camp that he's in. I understand why I'm in a different camp, and I still think I'm right, frankly. And I think the, the crux of this is what he said at one point in the interview, that, look, he's a data-driven economist, formally trained economist, and he's going by the data. What I'm talking about is a social change. I perceive a major change in the attitudes of both elected officials and the people electing them. I think that we're moving much more in the direction of socialism and an increased amount of government support and uh, stimulus and support, transfer payments and so forth. I think that there is a major secular political social change that's going to drive this inflation. And so my prediction of inflation isn't reflected at all in the data yet. I wouldn't expect it to be. When it is, I would expect David Rosenberg to catch up and uh, say, hey, <laughs> it's right. You know, it's just a question. Uh, I'm speculating about something I don't know with any certainty because I've got a really strong opinion about a secular political trend. David's saying, hey, I, I don't go by you know, political trends. I go by what the data is telling me. The data is not telling me that inflation is happening now. And he's right. That's not coming until later. Uh, I look forward to interviewing David again once I've been proven right or after I've been proven wrong, in which case I'll listen even more closely. In any event, Patrick, I want to move on to the post game chart deck. Now, we've got a special one for you this week, folks. You'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Of course, if you don't have a research roundup email, it means you're not registered yet. Just go to macrovoices.com, click the red button that says says looking for the downloads and we'll get you all signed up. The title of this week's chart deck is talking charts on commodities and crypto. So Patrick is going to be absolutely silent <laughs> and the charts are going to speak. Get ready. Here it comes. <laughs> All right, Eric. Well, I'm going to have to do all the talking. So let's uh, jump uh, to page two, where I just want to have a quick look at the S&P 500 before we start talking crypto and, and commodities. And again, that 50-day moving average continues to be the support where a lot of traders continue to focus on. And uh, right now, so far, the S&P has just looked like a, a typical market correction, very similar to what we have seen in February and March on numerous occasions testing that zone. It'd be really interesting to see with us going into this big option expiration and where where this gamma pin usually tends to, to prevail, whether or not some big volatility comes next week and whether that volatility is a breakout to the upside or whether or not that 50-day will be tested once again. And uh, that's uh, for sure uh, something that's going to be on my mind going into next week. But uh, on uh, page uh, three, I wanted to talk uh, the cryptos and start here with Bitcoin. 
and it was interesting because we both put up those charts last week and talked about uh, the, what's going on in the price action. And the one thing that uh, I was talking about was the fact that that all of the crypto traders needed at this moment for momentum to stay. Like whether uh, you have a strong belief in crypto or not, in order for prices to stay at these elevated levels, they need that positive emotional sentiment that drives that price action and keeps everyone interested. And Bitcoin was suffering from the fact that there was just a lack of real price progress, which uh, usually weans interest in it. And uh, the price action was deteriorating early uh, or late last week. And then uh, this week, suddenly, uh, we obviously get some China headlines and the selling came in pretty hard. This chart now on Bitcoin, some serious technical damage. And overall, there's easily going to be a bounce on Bitcoin that could make it back to 42 or even 45,000. But uh, there's a lot of technical repair work now that the bulls will have to do to turn this chart back up. And if this is anything like 2018 and the 2019 corrections, once uh, this starts, this creates a prolonged period of consolidation. And it doesn't uh, have to be some big fundamental shift. But really, if we, we don't see the bulls turn this around rapidly here, very, very quickly, odds are that this is going to be a systematic distribution cycle that could last many months before a Bitcoin attempts a, a, a bigger low. Yeah, I agree with you, Patrick. I would just add that uh, things happen a little faster in cryptocurrency than in the rest of the world. So I wouldn't be surprised if the norms that we usually apply for how long corrections typically take in other markets, I, I think regardless of whether it's a big down or a little down, I think how long it takes to play out in crypto is going to be shorter than in other markets. And we'll see what happens pretty quickly if that's right. I'm particularly interested to see if we get more weakness in Bitcoin if that leads to further strength in gold, which so far, it looks like at least some of the money coming out of the crypto space is going into the gold space. Is that the main thing driving the strength in gold and the weakness in Bitcoin? I have no idea. Right. Well, I do want to point out that uh, I was not referencing other types of charts, but rather like, for instance, back in 2018, it was uh, almost a 400 day correction that Bitcoin went through. And in 2019, the correction uh, that Bitcoin had back then also lasted uh, almost 260 days. And so so these corrections have uh, happened in crypto before, it's just prolonged consolidations. But one way or another, such a rapid drop certainly takes the wind out of the sails. And we're going to see whether or not they'll be able to recover it in short order. On page four and five, I have those charts of Ethereum and uh, Dogecoin. And and again, all of these uh, cryptos, just uh, it's obviously a devastating drop, uh, a big blow to the bulls, wiping out 50 plus percent in a very short period of time on these. And, and really, uh, again, it would be very natural for us to see snapbacks. It, 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 there's always reflexive retracements that occur after such devastating drops. But what will certainly be the thing to watch is that after we get a snapback rally, let's say Ethereum going to 3000 plus, will it, it just roll over again and begin another distribution cycle or will the bulls be able to just uh, put together consecutive up periods and start to repair the chart? I don't want to jump to too many conclusions this early after uh, such a drop, but uh, it's a very sensitive moment in the price action to determine whether or not this chart has uh, begun some sort of a more prolonged distribution cycle. With that said, I want to get to some commodity charts here, Eric, and let's start with that crude oil on page six. I have uh, the crude oil chart. And uh, even like I was uh, saying earlier, even earlier this week, it looked like uh, crude was ready to make a fresh uh, high. It was looking like it was turning up. And then obviously the, those headlines had us quickly begin a correction down towards $62 where we're trading now at the time of recording. We're testing right, right along that 50-day moving average. It's going to be a really interesting moment to see whether or not the bulls dig in and hold the line here or whether this becomes a, a bigger turn in crude where we could see a correction down into the mid 50s. What's your take on this? Well, Patrick, as you can see from the chart, we have a price channel drawn in, and the price has been moving since the middle of March very neatly in that nice, narrow $4 wide channel. And yesterday, it broke down out of that. Okay, does that mean we're going 
all the way back down to the recent lows around $57 or even lower than that to around $53, which is around where the uh, the next support layer ought to exist. Or are we already done? I really have no idea here. My base case has been that that channel was going to hold and take us all the way back up to a breakout to new all-time highs. It's not going that way. We're going to go down first before that happens. How far down? Frankly, I think it depends mostly on the sentiment reaction to headlines that are probably going to come out next week. We'll get some kind of announcement that says, essentially, the Iran nuclear deal is back on. The uh, the sanctions are going to be lifted. Iran's going to be able to sell its oil, not now, but in the future, after some future date when this all gets implemented. I expect... Headlines like that will probably shock us down to some final low shortly after those headlines come out next week. And that's probably a very viable bottom. And I suspect that the market is going to shrug this all off because I don't think this Iran thing is nearly as important as everybody else seems to. If I'm wrong about that, who, who knows? Maybe we're headed down to 53 bucks. I doubt it. All right. Well, let's move on to page seven where I have the chart of gold. And I also kept that 50-day moving average on there just to highlight that you know we've now spent uh, almost uh, two months consolidating above the uh, that 50-day moving average. But uh, often that moving average will get tested on pullbacks. And one of the things I just uh, want to highlight is that at any one time, we could easily have a $50, $60 pullback in, in the precious metals. And if this is in fact a new bull market, those uh, should be all bought on dip. And I think that's the one thing that I'm actually waiting for to really confirm that we are right on this call is, is that uh, one, we want to see what a correction looks like and how quickly the buy on dip traders come in, whether it's uh, very well supported and, and turns back up. And that's definitely the, the thing to watch in my mind. Patrick, lumber futures have really, really just been probably the, the most parabolic chart of any market in this recovery. Uh, what's going on here? Did, did, did we get to, uh, is that a dead cat bounce that we see beginning or is it actually bottomed and maybe heading to a new high? Yeah, we really saw that parabolic rise in lumber that we just saw uh, us just head right up to those early May highs uh, near 1700. It triggered a, a, a finally a correction and a correction that saw us uh, drop a solid $500 in, in uh, literally a week. And we uh, came right down to that 50-day moving average and uh, that has spurred at least a, a bullish reaction off that low. Uh, this is actually the really important moment in lumber in my mind, because if lumber manages to muster up a rally back up to the highs, then it means that the bull phase is not over. But uh, any uh, failure here to, to make any progress north of 1500 off of this bounce would give it a lot of price action characteristics similar to what Bitcoin had before it turned. And so we're, it'll be really interesting to see how much gusto the bulls have here and whether they can really start getting it right back to the previous high or whether or not this is going to start topping. Patrick, this is going to be fascinating to watch play out because, frankly, I don't know where this is headed. I can make a strong argument for why I think there's a good chance the final high is not in yet or the final top is not in. I, I think that what you see here is... Uh, really an out-of-control supply chain situation. All of a sudden, it's impossible for builders to get some things. People are freaking out about pandemic risk and wanting to buy new houses and move out of the city and so forth. And you just literally can't buy materials. And if you can buy the materials, then the delivery supply chain is encumbered by COVID. So I, I, as much as it looks like it's a parabolic top and surely the price can't go any higher than there, I think it probably can. We'll see what happens. Oh, I agree. And uh, it's too early to write off the bulls. I mean, when lumber got so ahead of itself, it was very natural for at some point us to enter some sort of profit-taking cycle, something that washed out the, the those that were late to the party. But uh, the jury's out. I think early next week's price action is going to be really important for me to make a, a higher conviction call on what's next for lumber. But I wanted to, uh, to look on pages 9 and 10 where I have a couple of the other commodities, copper and, uh, and corn. And what is interesting to me is that whether uh, like lumber, the grains and copper all seem to have put in their highs 
pretty much within a stone's throw of that inflation number that came out. And I thought it was really interesting that, you know, we have this big report of inflation coming in super hot and suddenly a commodities all begin some degree of a correction since that moment. And um, one of the interesting things that I'm watching here is that all of them are just correcting what we would define as a typical mean reverting correction, something that uh, is all above its moving averages, everything that typically in the past has been bought on dip. And uh, it's not just lumber that we're watching. I think the entire commodity complex outside of gold is at a very sensitive moment to to see whether or not those, these trends that have been in place since November continue. And that's uh, 100% on my mind. You know, when I'm looking on page nine at that copper chart, well, I mean, it does look just like a correction. But the one thing that, uh, you know, I ask uh, and think about is that I can't find anybody that is actually has a bare argument on copper. This is probably one of the single most consensus trades to be bullish copper out there. And uh, and the thing is, is that when it's that consensus, that's usually where uh, a trade is very crowded and it doesn't have that much further to go because simply everyone's already fully in. Uh, It'll be interesting to see whether that, that this very bullish sentiment toward these commodities does in fact mark some sort of uh, an intermediate high versus what we can only confirm as short-term highs right now. Well, Patrick, I certainly could not agree more that I do not know any bearish argument for copper other than it's way too crowded of a trade on the bullish side. That's the only reason, and it's a significant reason to be concerned. The thing is, the fundamental demand argument for copper is so incredibly strong. The bearish arguments uh, that have kept me out of it are exactly what you said, which is, you know, when we got it like $3 or so, and I said, boy, you know, the, the price has, you know, come up so much since the March low, you want to be buying copper around $2, not around $3. You know, I'll wait for the dip. I'll wait for the dip. And we're at prices already where, you know, as we come back down to, let's say we get back down to four spot 40 or so. Um, hey, that's pretty darn close to your 50-day line. It's very tempting. And I, I, the idea that four spot something is a buy in copper for a medium to long-term trade it was unthinkable just a few years ago. But I think that's part of this inflation. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, you know double that before this inflation is over. For those of you who don't want to be left out every step along the way, you can sign up for a free trial of Patrick's service, Big Picture Trading, where you can see chart decks like this from Patrick almost every single day. You'll find the information on page 12 of the chart deck or at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Freelancer.com, the Internet's premier website for putting independent freelance contractors in touch with employers who need their services. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to David Rosenberg's slides, as well as the chart book we just discussed here in the postgame. There was also a link to a Jeffrey Snyder article on Inflation Huge. Jay Powell did blink, but it had nothing to do with the taper. And as well as a link to Jesse Felder's article, An Epic Set of Alligator Jaws. And so you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets, we'd like to share that content with our listeners. Send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelled with a K and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. 
Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.